Good morning and welcome to the FEL Murowit Center program today on immigration and border challenges with Jean McNary. Jean is a former St. Louis County Chief Executive and served as the Commissioner of Immigration and Naturalization Service. And as Commissioner, Jean worked to increase the efficiency of agency operations and centralize the INS management budget controls and policy making at the headquarters. He also sought to balance effective enforcement of immigration laws with compassion. The McNary era initiatives included implementation of new regulations to govern asylum processing and the introduction of new technologies and innovations to streamline agency operations. Please welcome Jean McNary. All right, thank you, Judith. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Good morning, everyone. I already see some faces I recognize. Uh, I did this, I think it's almost been a year ago. So some of you may be bored with uh, hearing some of it again, because it's going to be, there have been significant changes, obviously, and I'll get into some of those that have happened in the last few months in the current state of the uh, southwest border. But uh, a couple of things. That come to mind uh, because of Judith's introduction of me, there's uh, the asylum. We set that up. And before I was there, the district director, oh, the, well, the border chiefs, district directors, border chiefs um, would make the decision. And, you know, strangely enough, nobody got asylum because they were, uh, it was a good old boys network. And, uh, and so we changed that and, and, and had training for people that uh, knew the asylum laws and went around the country. You have to be in the country to claim asylum. And that asylum court just, just did a great job. Uh, the other thing that happened on my watch, which is coming back now, and that was uh, under IRCA, Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986, they legalized some 7 million people. Well, it took from 86, I, I took over in 89. And by that time, we had all these people uh, ready to legalize and they, the case was there and we legalized 7 million, but we didn't legalize their children. So the children are still back in their country of origin. Uh, and I established what was called a family fairness program. We brought those kids in and I see that that is happening again today where they uh, are bringing the children in of uh, people who are US citizens, but uh, the kids are still on foreign soil. But in any case, uh, let me go through what the basic laws are, uh, how you get into this country legally and how you, what happens when you come in illegally. The uh, the, the laws are that you can come in um, either through family uh, by having a relative here. And of course, if you marry a US citizen, it's almost an immediate green card. And then three years later, you naturalize, become a US citizen. If you're immediate family, it's also fairly uh, expeditious, um, but brothers and sisters, can take a long time and that's kind of the extent of the extended family um, Filipinos waited 17 years you know and we, that created problems they started adopting each other and all kinds of shenanigans um, and we created a special we needed nurses and so we created a special non-immigrant visa uh, or immigrant visa for uh, nurses and we brought in a lot of Filipinos and you'll still see uh, a lot of nurses that are, that are uh, Filipino origin. Um, then the, the other way you get a, a green card is through a job. And these are employment-based. Uh, EB1 is uh, extraordinary. You get a Nobel Prize and we'll bring you in in a minute. Uh, those are extraordinary people. I brought in a um, yoga master 
but he, he was extraordinary, you know, and so it can, it can be a dancer or uh, uh, somebody who's outstanding. Then EB2 is exceptional, but that has to be in the national interest. Um, but if it is, then it, there's a, there is a distinction between extraordinary and exceptional. Then EB3 is skilled and somebody who is skilled still has to go through labor certification. That's designed to uh, make sure that we don't bring somebody in that's gonna take a job away from somebody else. And so we have to show that no American could get this job and that's, that's called labor certification. Um, the funny thing about it is I brought in Indians, Asian Indians, because they could uh, do tandoori and nobody else could. <laughs> and so you'd advertise the job. You have to know Tondori and nobody would answer the, the ad except your client or my client. And so um, that was good. We had a, a Mexican, in fact, the, the, it's still there, Rui Costello and Rui, it's out off of 70 around uh, Wright City. And Rui, um, we got a green card for him because, we, and we created a special uh, dish that he knew how to make and nobody else could. <laughs> and so we even named it after him. Uh, so in any case, he got through labor certification because nobody, that's, that's the, uh, uh, the law. And it's probably a good law. It's designed to, to protect uh, Americans in their jobs and not just bring people in uh, to take away those jobs. In any case, then EB4 is the nurses. And that's a special category because we've had a shortage of nurses. I don't know if we still do or not. We still have the EB4 though. And EB5 was created, the law was passed on my watch. And then I did a bunch of them. There's Terry, hi Terry. And, uh, and the, the law was that if you invest, this is the first time you didn't have to have a job uh, to come in on an employment based, that you can make an investment of a million dollars or in a, in a depressed area or rural area, it could be 500,000. Uh, that investment had to create 10 jobs and it couldn't, uh, you couldn't have any drug money involved, those were the conditions. But we've done a lot of those I know, last, last I knew, and this is a long time ago, over several billion dollars in investment has come in, a lot of it in New York, um, and it's created those jobs and it's helped uh, rebuild depressed areas. So, and I did about 300 of those. That, that, was, uh, that, that was good business. So those are the five employment-based categories. Um, and if you come in uh, temporarily, if you come in w w for a specific period of time for a specific purpose, that's a non-immigrant visa. And there's a whole alphabet of them. The most common is B, uh, that's a visitor. And the uh, visitor, now we, we also have what's called visa waiver, which uh, for a visitor, which means that in those countries that have a good return record, in other words, the people don't violate the terms of the visa, they go back on time. Um, you go to the airport with a round trip ticket and you don't need a visa. That's called visa waiver. And the countries that qualify are basically European and Japan. Uh, during my watch, the Italians had a hard time remembering when to go back. And so we had to pull their visa waiver uh, privilege, uh, but then they, once they uh, started being good again, uh, it was reinstated. The, um, so those are the, those are the uh, usually a visitor comes in for uh, six months and then has to go back. Um, H-1B is an employment-based uh, uh, visa, and you come in for six years. And these uh, H-1B is, uh, uh, they're, they're basically 
college graduates, but their specialty occupations. We have millions, I think last I do it was six, but it's probably up to 10 million Asian Indians. Asian Indians have the advantage of speaking young English to begin with. And then they learned that from the Brits. Um, and, and they come in on their computer science uh, and they came in on H-1Bs. And then during that period of time, they found a job, the employer sponsored them for a green card and uh, most of them stayed. Asian Indians also are uh, doctors. 47% of American doctors are Asian Indians. Uh, that su surprises a lot of people. Uh, and they've been great and they, most of them or a lot of them came in on a J visa, which uh, has a two, what's called a two year residency requirement, which means that before you can become a, get a green card, uh, you have to go back home for two years and impart the knowledge you've gained here uh, to help your home country. But that was really kind of uh, defeated with uh, doctors because we, we enticed the doctors who went to pass the test and some of them went to medical school here. If they went to an underserved area, then we waived the two year residency requirement. And I think a lot of the Asian Indians did that. Uh, and so we have a lot of doctors that, I don't know if Jay Shaw's plugged in, but most of you know him, he's a lifelong learning regular. Um, F visa is regular student visa. Now J is a student visa, but it has those other conditions. Uh, F is the student visa that most students come in on. And um, I'll talk a little later on, on reform because there's a reform package and I'll, I'll list some of those uh, issues. But one of them is that I think if we train somebody that graduate here, then um, they shouldn't have to depend on a job, an employer to file the paperwork for them to get a green card. Uh, we should give them a green card outright. If we, especially in the STEM uh, areas, which are in demand, science, technology, engineering, medical, and whatever the other M is, um, they should get a green card. In any case, those are the students. And uh, well, some of the others, M is a, is a job, but it's more like a mechanic. Uh, P is professional, the athletes come in on that. O is outstanding, that can be short of uh, uh, an EB one or two, but they come in temporarily. So <clears throat> those are basically, now they, you've heard of uh, the, the V, uh, what is it, V, uh, anyway, the S visa is special and that's what we brought those Afghan refugees in on. And we're gonna get, we're gonna get, who's cutting me out? <laughs> Gerald, uh, Gerald Bamberger, I remember you. <laughs> uh, and I sell dangers over there too, smiling. I, I'm starting to feel right at over. In any case, um, the Afghan refugees came in on a special uh, visa. And I think we're gonna get 1200 of them here in St. Louis, uh, I read that. We've got the International Institute, uh, which I think many of you know about. And that was, uh, uh, gee, what was her name? She just retired, but uh, uh, Cross Crossland, Anna Crossland. Yeah, it was outstanding. She brought the Bosnians in. They've been a great asset uh, to St. Louis. And uh, I'm involved in a project to bring some work release people into North St. Louis. We want them to help rebuild North St. Louis. And um, we'd like to have some of those Afghan refugees in North St. Louis, you know, the, that um, new, new uh, federal agency is located located up there and 
it's all coming together. I think that's going to help. But anyway, let me get back to um, the basics. Uh, you also can come in. So now those are the, the employment-based, family-based, and non-immigrant visas. And um, you, you can also come in as a refugee. Now, a refugee is someone who either is persecuted or has a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, political affiliation, um, and some other things. I, I had a couple of uh, uh, gay guys who were persecuted in their country, really even kind of tortured. And um, it w had a humor, humorous side because they were both good looking guys. And the, all the ladies in the law office thought that was so unfair that these guys should be uh, involved with each other. But uh, they made, you know, the case was there and I argued it uh, for them and they were uh, given asylum. Um, some of them, Jehovah's Witnesses kind of bothered me. I got the asylum for them based on religious persecution. It bothered me because they don't, they don't believe in government. They don't vote here. They wanted to take advantage our, of our uh, religious uh, freedoms, uh, but they didn't want to be a part of the government. The Brits also bothered me who wanted to get a green card, but they wouldn't nat naturalize. You know, they still want to be Brits, just take advantage of all of our uh, privileges and uh, benefits. So, but anyway, those are just personal uh, items. Uh, during uh, my watch, the uh, Soviet Union broke up in 89. And during confirmation, I committed to go to Moscow and oversee the, the, um, the, the adjudication of uh, those who were lined up. They, they'd stay overnight at the embassy out on the street waiting to get in, um, pre predominantly Jews, because the Jews uh, had to have uh, their religion in their passport. So they were identified and that really was clear making a case that uh, they were singled out and persecuted. Um, so we brought in 50,000 a year for three years. That was the most in the history of uh, the total. Well, that was just out of Russia. The total uh, over those three years was over 100,000 a year, the refugees we, we brought in. Um, yeah, they stayed overnight outside and waited to come in. Then they were sent to um, Rome, where I also went, and they were debriefed there. We learned a lot from those refugees who came into the United States. We learned a lot about, um, about the Soviet Union and Russia, and uh, it helped make the transition during that breakup. I remember being at uh, Peking Duck in, uh, in Virginia, Fairfax, um, and Jack Danforth was there with um, uh, oh, that Supreme Court Justice, uh, uh, and I can't think of his name anyway. He was just going through confirmation. And Sally Danforth gets a hold of me, grabs me by the collar and says, you get those Russian scientists in here. And of course, I obey her order. And so I got those Russian scientists in. All right, the uh, asylum, one of the rules which is relevant now is that you can't go through another country and then claim refugee status if you had a chance to uh, be safe and not in the country that you came through. That, that's true of asylum as well. And, and it's currently relevant because uh, people from Central America that are coming up and overwhelming our border. Uh, Trump, Trump was a master. Now you may not like him and I don't blame you if you don't, but 
We never have had the, the cooperation of the Mexicans and he leveraged that trade in exchange for uh, their cooperation and was able to get the, the Mexicans to keep those people before they came across our uh, backyard, in effect. And then when, when Biden came in, the worst thing he could have done was to change that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not the law. You can't come through another country where you're not persecuted uh, and then claim asylum because asylum is the same legal definition for well-founded fear of persecution based on race, nationality, and, uh, religion, and whatnot. And these people are coming for either two reasons, uh, either criminal um, concerns that they're going to be in danger or economic concerns. Neither one of those is persecution. And they were, Lautenberg wrote the definition he was Jewish, so he kind of tailored it to help the Jews. But uh, you know, th there's there's no we we can't we can't absorb everybody that needs to a better economic condition, a job, or is subject to um, subject to uh, uh, criminal concerns. Now. The, <clears throat> We also have what's called temporary protected status, and that's not either a refugee or um, asylum, but it's just that when there's a civil war or uh, some real short term, hopefully, uh, problem in a country and people are here, you have to be here to claim TPS. But if they're here, then we don't send them back to harm's way. And we have a lot of El Salvadorans um, and a few other countries that are here. And it's, it's gone from temporary protected status to uh, permanent protected status. And, and they should have gone back a long time ago. And there was a movement to send some of them back. But during COVID, even that has uh, come to a halt. So there's uh, that leads to a lot of problems. One of the things that made me feel good, and I, I guess I just didn't know, but on my watch, there was a civil war in Liberia. And my agency, INS, seemed to be really concerned about that. And the reason was that we had some Liberians who were here and they're black. And there was a history of uh, going back to the Civil War when we sent some people back to Africa, Blacks back to Africa, they went to Liberia, and there was a feeling in our agency that those were Americans. Isn't that kind of interesting? Those were Americans and we better take care of them because you know, it wasn't their fault, they just got sent back there. So anyway, those are some anecdotes that, um, uh, that kind of give you a flavor for immigration. Now, the structure, I think most of you know the difference between the State Department and now Homeland Security. During my watch, it was INS. And um, people who get a visa go to the embassy in uh, the country where they live, and they, they have to show to the consulate that they'll come back. And the way that they show that is they've got a job, they've got family there, and they explain that and they get the visa, and then they, they come in. Uh, once they get to the United States, then at the airports and the various ports of entry, the INS is the gatekeeper, and you're going to be asked questions, and you have to pass again. Those are separate agencies, and not even the president of the United States can tell the uh, embassies what to do. And he and the president didn't tell us much what to do either. So, uh, but those are the ways you come in and the inspections. Um, and that's the di difference between states. State still has that same role. Now the, uh, the ports and the inspections are uh, uh, by Homeland Security. 
When you go to uh, the airport to fly out, TSA is a part of Homeland Security now. Uh, the Coast Guard is part of Homeland Security. That was separate uh, from uh, when I was there. Uh, <clears throat> then the, the uh, INS used to have internal enforcement. That's now called ICE. It's Immigration Customs Enforcement. We used to have uh, Border Patrol. Now that's US CBP, US Customs Border Protection. And then the, uh, the paperwork and uh, legal processing um, we, we was under INS. Now that's called Customs Immigration Services. And they do the, the green card processing, uh, naturalizations, and all of the uh, legal paperwork. Now, the... the um, Issues that, um, well, wait, I, I could still better tell you a few other things. The, if you come into the airport and you don't have the right documentation, they can put you on the next plane back. And they do, that's called summary exclusion. And we have that at the, still have that at the airport and we, we have it to a certain extent at the, the ports of entry, the land ports. Um, and, and even people who run across and are still within a few miles, and it may be more than a few miles, um, can be uh, summarily excluded. Then there's, in case you read about it, there may be because we're overwhelmed now with illegal immigrants and especially at the border, uh, they may decide to do summary deportation. And summary deportation would be a quick and dirty hearing. Uh, if you don't have the case, then they put you on the next plane out. That's, that's quick and, and efficient. The, uh, the courts, when you read about it, the courts are not a part of the judicial system. The courts used to be a part of justice. And I hate to tell you this, but I can't tell you if they're still a part of justice or if they're a part of Homeland Security. But the, uh, the, the courts are administrative and they're the ones who decide uh, whether somebody should be deported or whether they have a case for remaining here. Um, the, 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 I think I mentioned when, uh, and this is still a major issue, uh, Trump set it up so that uh, Mexicans uh, kept these people, they it was called remain in Mexico, and it was successful in cutting down the uh, uh, the numbers of people trying to get here and stay here. Uh, but then when, when uh, Biden came in, he, he uh, ruled that out. And, and that was probably uh, the worst thing he could have done. He stopped building the wall. He, he, he said, we're not gonna make them remain in Mexico. He did some other things that were an open invitation, just get here and you'll get in. And that's what, they did, and I think we're still um, suffering from that. And remain in Mexico now. I think the Biden administration is uh, changing that, and they've they're in the process of uh, restoring remain in Mexico. And, and strangely enough, the uh, Texas uh, Attorney General and the Missouri Attorney General were the ones who brought that lawsuit that uh, restored remain in Mexico. Now, the, a lot of issues on the table and there's no reason, and it could have been done 10 years ago, there's no reason they can't make some compromise decisions and pass some laws that will resolve some of these uh, questions. And there's something for the so-called progressives uh, and something for the conservatives that they can agree on. The conservatives just feel as though, and I'm one of them, 
you can't legalize uh, 11 million illegal aliens who would benefit from breaking our laws. And it sends a message to uh, the people who have waited in line and are coming in legally that uh, you jump the queue and you can get by with it. That's, that's a tough one to defend. Um, anyway, here are some of those issues. E-Verify was passed in 1986, but it's, uh, it's not mandatory. And E-Verify is when somebody gets a job, uh, the, the employer has to verify that they have a work permit and they can be legally employed. That should be made mandatory. And I think they could agree on that. Exit control, strangely enough, every other country that you've gone to and visited, they know when you leave, we don't. We don't know when somebody leaves. And so the only way we know if there's an overstay is when that person goes back uh, to the embassy to try to come in again. And then they either have to lie about when they came back to uh, their home country or they have to tell the truth and then they, they've overstayed and they're not gonna get a visa. Um, so in any case, exit control uh, needs to be done. Now there's also um, a law that says if you overstay by six months, then you can't come back into the country and then you leave, you can't come back into the country for three years. And if you overstay by a year, you can't come back into the country for 10 years. I think those are uh, harsh. And, you know, I represented a young man who came here and fell in love. And he had to choose between leaving this girl he was in love with or overstaying. And he overstayed. I, I would favor re repealing those overstay penalties. I think we've got some 40% of the illegals in this country are overstays. And I wonder how many of them would go back uh, and come in right. They didn't have this, uh, this re bar. Um, I think it's time to repeal the lottery. 50,000, we bring in 50,000 people. It's, a, it's strictly a lottery. Uh, uh, Ted Kennedy wanted it to get more Irish into the country and it served a purpose. And usually we've gotten good people, but uh, there's no reason to keep the lottery any longer. Uh, the DACA dreamers, that's an issue because it's been ruled illegal. It's not illegal for the president who has prosecutorial discretion under the constitution. It's not illegal for him to say, uh, I'm not gonna send you back or deport you, but it is illegal for him to give them work permits. There's no justification for that. And that's what uh, Obama did. Uh, and, and so DACA is presently under uh, judicial scrutiny. It's been ruled illegal. They've, they've uh, put on hold any deportations until it's uh, further digested in the courts. Um, I into a reform package. I don't know why we have to uh, send these people back. It was not their fault that they were brought here illegally. It was probably our fault that we let them be brought. Uh, but they, a good many of them now are, are uh, not only teenagers, but 20 years old. This is the only country they know. They don't even know another language. And so I would legalize the uh, DACA dreamers. Uh, there could be a pathway to citizenship for those who came in legally. That includes uh, TPS and overstays. They came in legally. Uh, and I'm, I would support that. I, I just don't believe that we can throw into that uh, as strangely enough, as the Democrats have in this uh, build back better troop trillion dollar package. They've thrown some uh, uh, immigration, uh, including some amnesty uh, provisions into that. And I think they threw in uh, some DACA provisions too. I, nobody expects that to survive, but, uh, but, but 
DACA and a pathway to citizenship for people who legal, entered legally is uh, a possibility. Uh, as I mentioned, green cards for people that graduate, if we educate them, they should get a green card uh, and then go get a job rather than depend on the employer uh, to file the paperwork for them. We need to eliminate sanctuary cities. Uh, it's even reached the point now you've noticed that New York's gonna let the illegal, well, aliens, non-citizens vote, not in uh, state or federal elections, but in local elections. And I, I think that's a slippery slope. Um, sanctuary cities, we had two of them on my watch, one, Sac Sacramento and, and San Francisco passed ordinances saying uh, it was uh, against the law to cooperate with uh, INS. Uh, and our internal uh, enforcement. Uh, now that's absurd. You know, there's a supremacy clause uh, in the Constitution that gives the, the federal government has has preempted the immigration field. They do that through the naturalization, which is in the Constitution, and and uh, it's used against them. But there's no justification for the state and local enforcement people not to cooperate with ICE. That's, that's a clear constitutional. Anyway, uh, we sanctuary cities uh, um, need to be a part of the reform package. They need to be uh, eliminated. Uh, it, it needs to be a requirement that they cooperate with the uh, with federal uh, immigration authorities. Um, we need to expedite deportations, as I mentioned, and um, and under Trump, and I agreed with it, he would uh, adjust the green card quotas uh, to more merit-based. Uh, that's the difference between, as I mentioned, the employment-based and the family. And uh, we need more based, more merit-based because they serve the national interest. Um, you know, we've prospered because of immigrants who yeah, that computer chip was an Asian in, in the department. We really prospered because of the result, the, the immigrants that uh, have come here and, and uh, helped make us uh, a greater nation. All right, that's, uh, that's the, anybody got a question so far on, uh, we're gonna last 15 minute, minutes are gonna be for discussion. So, but that's kind of the, Basics, I think I've covered most of the basics. Um, in any case, now that the issues on the border, um, I, I don't know about you, but I happen to like uh, Jason Riley, the Wall Street Journal. And Jason Riley really was is kind of, uh, critical of Biden, but, um, but he says that, that third behind economy and COVID uh, among concerns of uh, Americans is immigration. And he says that still dreamers, especially uh, still a political reality is that most voters understand that we're a nation of laws, including immigration laws that are being flouted without consequence under this administration. Um, White House officials pay lip service to border security, but messages don't get more mixed than telling people not to come here while simultaneously drawing up plans for the largest uh, amnesty in the nation's history. Um, I think there's some merit to that. Um, and there seems to be a division as there should be in the administration, uh, a rift at the highest levels of the administration over uh, border direction, immigration policy should take and um, asylum the uh, overhauling the immigration system to resolve requests for asylum faster, give asylum seekers the ability to amply uh, 
to apply from their home countries. You don't apply for asylum from your home country, you apply for refugee status, but that can be and should be done. You, you know, you, you don't just go to another country. And as I said before, the laws are that if you could go through a country that where you could have, where you weren't persecuted and you could have claimed asylum, you have to claim or, or refugee status, you have to ask for it there. <clears throat> and we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot. Um, Dean, we but, have a couple of, I just wanted to let you know, we oh, have a couple of people with their hand up. Um, okay. We have uh, Steve Radinsky and then Jitendra. Steve, you okay. want to go first and then Jitendra next? Why don't you let Mara talk, Steve? <laughs> she, that's okay with me. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, it's great seeing you on TV here. Uh, as you know, we, as you said, we have a problem at the border. We had uh, in recent months of over 200,000 that were just uh, caught and released and let go. And, and another estimated 50 to some say 100,000 that are not even uh, apprehended that are just coming in. And this is going, this is happening in the middle of a terrible pandemic here where I, we, we, we know that the, the 50 to 100,000 that we don't catch every month, who knows how many of these have COVID or uh, who knows what, what other disease they have. And, um, and we, we're in the midst of a really uh, an Omicron thing here, which is exploding over in the UK. And I have a feeling it's starting to explode here in the United States. We have some cities like Philadelphia and up in Michigan where they're being overwhelmed by infections. So uh, I don't understand how we can allow these people to come in not vaccinated or even vaccinated and, and not knowing where they're going. And uh, in, in the middle of a pandemic, it makes absolutely no sense to me how, how we can do this in, 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 in what, what's one of the worst pandemics in the last hundred years. The, um, so this is approximately three million people, at least three million people a year. That's the size of St. Louis 10 times over. How do we educate these? How, how do we give them schooling, medical, housing? food what 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 is this the cost to to everybody here when we can't even take care of a lot of our own people we don't even have health care for many of our own people yet all of these people get health care the other big problem that we haven't talked about here is the drugs coming over the border and that's why we need more this is probably a bigger bigger problem than than the immigrants coming over here or the illegals and um, last year over we had over I think 100,000 people that just died of drug overdose, 100,000 drug overdoses. And a lot of this is fentanyl, which a lot of it is made in China and gets to Mexico and comes over the border. So if I could put you back in charge today and I will call up Biden myself and put you in charge. <laughs> What would you do to stop these? How, how do we stop this and, and, and put some sense behind uh, all the illegals coming over and, and our horrendous drug company, a drug problem that is just devastating our country? All right. Well, Steve, thanks. The, uh, the as I mentioned, this remain in Mexico is currently before the courts and the Biden administration is now uh saying uh that they're in favor of it and they're in the process of restoring that another is a provision known as title 42 that gives federal health officials powers during pandemic to take extraordinary measures to limit uh, transmission of infectious disease the white house uh, has appealed a judge's ruling that ended the regulation the administration has used the provision to justify the deportation of Haitian migrants who entered uh, Texas, as you'll remember. Yeah, U.S. Border Patrol reported more than 1.6 million encounters with migrants along the U.S. Uh, border uh, between September of 2020 and September of 2021, more than quadrupled the number in the prior fiscal year and the highest annual total on record. 
No question. There's a lot of problems that illegal immigration causes. Uh, most, I always felt most notably, you, you've got people who can't, uh, can't surface really and live uh, lives. They're not supposed to have a job. Uh, they have to live in the underground. But now with the uh, health concerns, I don't know how these people can be screened uh, and there, there is this title of 42, the federal government has the authority to, uh, to stop them from coming in or to set up uh, and set up uh, screening mechanisms so that we don't bring people in and add to the uh, COVID problem.